Welcome back. As part of step one, reduce, today I'm going to show you a lot of examples of passive and smart bioclimatic design. Passive design refers to solutions that do not require auxiliary technology to be effective. And as you may remember, this is the definition of smart bioclimatic design, a design approach that deploys local characteristics intelligently in the sustainable design of buildings and urban plants. Now let's see what these local characteristics can entail. They can be related to natural circumstances, the climate, weather and geomorphology. But they can also refer to man-made interventions such as the landscape, built surroundings and features of various kinds. Let's look at these man-made interventions first and see if they are planned in a sustainable way. This is the central business district of Toronto. Just like many other cities, we see a high density of buildings, high-rise and low-rise, well-structured but seemingly disoriented. We cannot determine the exact orientation towards the sun, neither from the facade nor from the street patterns. This is different when a building has been deliberately designed to be sustainable, such as this factory in Germany. What you see here is the north side. The sloped glass roofs have photovoltaics to the south and the low western eastern sun is blocked by reflective white facade panels. The optimal orientation of solar panels can be a means of architectural expression. Perhaps this is not the best example. If solar panels are to be placed later, they will often be an addition, whereas integration in the early design stage will make them part of the passive and bioclimatic architecture. I think this is a very nice example of a bioclimatic building that has fully taken into account the course of the sun, without causing undesired warming up. On the left you see that steel flaps are avoiding direct insulation, while admitting daylight through the completely transparent glass skin behind the flaps. From this picture on the right you can deduct the sun's course through the sky. And if you are daring enough you can guess the building's location, right? The orientations of the flaps suggest that the sun is coursing overhead. Now where on the planet does this happen? Around the equator, where the sun at midday is about 90 degrees altitude, high in the sky above the observer. So where is this? Singapore. At 2 degrees northern latitude, so practically on the equator. So you see that the designer took some smart decisions. The idea of flaps is a similar concept as overhangs, as you can see here, with Sydney's Opera House and even clearer with the building on the right. The protruding overhanging roof avoids direct insulation of the interior, which reduces the cooling demand. Yet another solution can be seen here, again in Singapore, where this office tower was designed with windows tilting downwards. As a result, there is hardly any direct sunlight reaching the interior, and people can still look downward from their office desks. In hot and warm climates, the avoidance un of unnecessary warming up of buildings is very important in the design of a building, especially with the prospect of climate change. Yet also, the urban setting is quite decisive. With old settlements, one can often see that the urban plan was made dense and compact, allowing little sunlight onto the streets and facades. Light reflecting surfaces can then avoid the absorption of solar heat in the building envelope. These are typical examples of that. Whitewashed stone walls and roofs in Greece. The reflective factor of surfaces is called albedo. Now, let's have a look at passive means of ventilation. You already saw that ventilation can be established by over and under pressure. Thermal stacking is another way. A south-oriented dark stony surface will heat up during the day and consequently heat the air above it. This air then becomes lighter and it will rise upwards. Thus, a thermal draft is created. I noticed this coincidentally when I was visiting a Mayan temple a long time ago where you could feel a cooling upward draft from the stairs. This principle can be used when we want to create naturally enforced ventilation, such as through solar chimneys. Here you see a test model of one. A dark steel or stone slab behind a glass pane can induce a strong draft, creating under pressure below the chimney. Open a hatch or grill at the bottom and at the top, and a strong airflow will, ev will evolve. Although it's not it will not always work, for instance when there is no sun, a solar chimney can help to ventilate the building without fans hence save energy, and also to cool the building in a passive way. 
Other means of passive cooling can be established by using water. Running water can provide cooling by two means. One, if the water is coming from the underground, from example from drinking water pipes or from groundwater, there will be a temperature difference that already helps to cool a surface. Two, if the relative humidity of the air is not too high, evaporation can be an important factor in cooling a surface or, or air because evaporating water extracts heat from its environment. This principle can be used to cool down air coming into buildings. Fresh air is then let in through an air channel which in which water droplets are falling, evaporating by the warm incoming air and hence cooling it on the way. In humid climates, such as a tropical climate, the principle of evaporative cooling works less well. Therefore, different passive solutions are needed to cool or better phrased to make people feel cooler. Air flows do that. The higher the airspeed, the cooler one will feel. We know this from the effect of strong winds and of fans. The sensible temperature is much lower. What the architect Ken Yang did here was accelerate the airflow through the building by using the Bernoulli effect. A narrowing tunnel will increase the speed of the fluid or gas passing through. Another very smart example is this one. This looks like an urban umbrella meant to cover people on the ground from the occasional tropical rain shower. So far nothing special, except for the size perhaps. What makes a solution so smart is what happens afterwards. Water captured on the plastic foil is starting to evaporate as soon as the sun starts shining again. This leads to the cooling of air directly underneath the foil, which then drops downward. There are even nozzles that direct the downflow in cool air. It is estimated that this system can lead to cooling down street level air by a few degrees, which can make a big difference in the comfort of pedestrians. And finally, I want to conclude with the natural means we have at disposal to use for both cooling and air purification. I'm of course talking about plants, which can create shading and, if they get sufficient water, naturally evaporate and transpire, because of which they cool their environs. Next to applications in the urban built environment, plants are ever more used functionally in buildings because of their positive physical and psychological effects. And that brings me to the closure of this lesson. I hope you found ideas to work on your passive and smart bioclimatic solutions to reduce the energy demand. Good luck and see you again next time.